Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for uh, your word, your sustaining grace, um, your spirit, your Holy Spirit that guides and directs us. We ask that that same Holy Spirit would be with us now, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and minds together would be pleasing and acceptable, Lord, in your sight. For, Lord, you're our rock and you're our redeemer. Amen. Well, history is full of famous brothers, uh, like the Brothers Grimm. Uh, you may not know, but the Brothers Grimm, authors of Grimm's fairy tales. That's why we have the stories of Cinderella and Little Red Riding Hood and Sleeping Beauty and Snow White and why Disney's made all those movies is because of Grimm's fairy tales. Uh, we have the Wright brothers who were the first in, in flight, who were the first men to have mechanized flight and heavier, you know, light, heavier than air airplane actually be able to work, the pioneers of aviation. Uh, there are brothers in sports like the Manning brothers, Peyton and Eli Manning, uh, both uh, great football players. There are famous brothers like uh, Prince William and Prince Harry that seem to be on every magazine cover just about all the time. Uh, there are also, though, brothers in the Bible, like Cain and Abel, the first brothers in the Bible. Their relationship did not work out very well between Cain and Abel. Uh, there's Jacob and Esau, who were twin brothers, and also a very uh, rocky relationship between Jacob and Esau. Another set of brothers in the Bible is Peter and Andrew, these fishermen. Or as often as we think about it, Peter and Andrew. <laughs> Peter and Andrew. I started talking last week about some of the other disciples. Some of the disciples and followers of Jesus in the Bible who are not the most familiar ones, not the ones that we know a ton about. And so today I want to talk about Andrew. Andrew. It seems like he is often known as Peter's brother. Brother of Simon Peter, Andrew. Often in the Bible, when it mentions Andrew, it, makes, it reminds us, this is Peter's brother. It's not easy being famous because of who your brother is. <laughs> it's not easy being the brother of somebody who's more famous. Ask, uh, ask Billy Carter, uh, brother of President Carter, or Jeb Bush, uh, brother of President Bush. I mean, it's not easy being the brother of someone who's more famous. But Andrew, well, there's some things that we need to know about Andrew. Now, Emily just read a little bit about Andrew, but when we think about the call of the disciples, when we think about Jesus calling Peter and Andrew to follow him, often we read the story in the first three Gospels, in Matthew and Mark and Luke. And if you only read the story of the calling of the first disciples from Matthew and Mark and Luke, um, it almost seems like Peter and Andrew agreed to follow a total stranger. <laughs> because here's how Matthew and Mark and Luke tell the story. This is Matthew 4. It says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, and they were, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once... They left their nets and followed him. Now, if that's the only story you have, if that's the only version of the story you have, you kind of picture Jesus walking along, seeing these two fishermen and saying, hello, total strangers. Hello, two guys I've never seen in my life. Will you leave your jobs, leave your families and follow me so that you can fish for humans? And these two fishermen go, certainly perfect stranger. Certainly person we've never seen in our lives. Certainly someone who is definitely not having a halo over their head or glowing. Certainly perfect stranger. We'll leave our jobs and our families to follow you, this random person, to wherever. I mean, if you read it, just that story, it seems like this is the first time they've met. And that somehow Jesus calls these two fellows that he's never seen before to suddenly drop everything and follow him. Well, thankfully... John gives us more. <laughs> John gives us more of the story that lets us know this is not the first time Jesus encountered these two brothers. 
John tells us there's more of the story. And so as we read the Gospel of John, uh, he tells us first about the ministry of John the Baptist. And of course, we've got to keep our Johns straight. John the Gospel writer. John, who is also one of the twelve, brother of James, fishing partner with Peter and Andrew. John the Gospel writer tells us about John the Baptist. Really, more appropriately, John the Baptizer would be a better translation. John was not a Southern Baptist. John was somebody who baptized, John the Baptizer. And John the Baptizer comes out of the desert wearing sort of mountain man clothes, eating bugs, being just kind of a wild man and preaching hellfire and brimstone. Uh, He was a, a radical kind of character. And he started preaching this message of repentance Turn around from your sins, turn around from your wicked ways, and get ready. Get ready because the Messiah is nearly here. Get ready, the Messiah is coming. He says, straighten out your lives, straighten out your path, and come to the water and be baptized as a sign of your repentance. And so John the Baptist, John the baptizer, has this ministry of calling people to repentance, calling people to be baptized. And he gains followers. And one of those followers of John the Baptizer is Andrew. He's Andrew. And John says that one day, John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, saw Jesus at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. And when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said to his followers, Look, look, the Lamb of God. There he is, the one I've been talking about, the one I've been saying is going to come. There he is, the Lamb of God, right over there. And two of John the baptizer's followers ran over to meet Jesus. And one of the two who was a follower of John the baptizer, one of the two who ran to meet Jesus was Andrew. And Andrew starts talking to Jesus, asking him, where are you staying? What are you doing? And Andrew and the other unnamed follower end up spending the day with Jesus. And then that's the setting that we read, that Emily read a moment ago, when it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said. This is John the baptizer. One of the two who heard what John the baptizer had said and who followed Jesus. And the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother, Simon Peter. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother, Simon Peter, and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. So Andrew, Andrew is the first of the 12 disciples to follow Jesus. Andrew is the first of the 12 to follow Jesus. He's the first to call him Messiah. He's the one who introduces his brother, Simon Peter, to Jesus. And because of this, because Andrew is the first of the twelve, the first to introduce his brother to Jesus, Andrew had a name in Greek, in the Greek church. They called Andrew the protoclete. The protoclete, which means the first to follow. The protoclete, the first. Andrew is the protoclete. He is the first to follow. Now, the church has given Andrew another nickname. The church has also called Andrew the usher. The usher. Because Andrew was about the business of ushering people into the presence of Jesus. You know, an usher's job is to bring people in where they can encounter Jesus. An usher's job is to bring people into a place where they then can meet Christ, where they can meet the risen Lord. And so Andrew has been called the usher because he ushered people into the presence of Jesus. Now, for example, we don't have that many stories about Andrew, but we have a couple. For example, during the feeding of the 5,000, and this is a story that's in all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000. It's a miracle that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell us about. And you know the setting of this this miracle. Jesus is preaching and teaching a a huge crowd for hours and hours and hours. 
Jesus is such a fascinating speaker. Jesus is such a dynamic presence. Jesus taught in a way that no one had ever taught before. People are spellbound by Jesus' preaching that they would listen to him for hours. And they're out kind of in the middle of nowhere, frankly. They follow Jesus out into a place far away from any village or town, and they've just been listening to him talk for hours until it gets late in the day. And everybody's hungry. And there's not a McDonald's nearby. You know, there's no quick trip, there's nowhere to get food anywhere close to where they are. But these people haven't eaten all day. And so in this situation, after hours of listening to Jesus, and, and everybody's hungry and they're nowhere close to food, Jesus turns to his disciples, and here's what John tells us in his version of the, this story. Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, and he says to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him. He already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answers him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to even have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Well, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Like, I got this. So think about this situation here. There's all these people, and when Jesus says to the disciples, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to feed these folks? You know, how are we going to make sure they all have some bread? Philip was like, are you, are you kidding? <laughs> Lord, you know, even if there were a place to buy it, which there's not, even if there was a, you know, if there was a Panera bread close by, which there wasn't, even if there was a place to buy the bread, we don't have that kind of money to feed 5,000 people. To even buy enough bread so that everybody could have just a bite would be half a year's wages. And we don't carry that kind of money. You know, we, we can't do this. But Andrew sees that there's a boy whose mom packed him a sack lunch. <laughs> you know. This boy's got his sack lunch. He's got his PBJ and bag of Doritos in his lunch. Well, it actually wasn't a PBJ and a sack of Doritos. It was actually five little barley rolls and a couple of small fish, probably smoked fish. So this boy has a couple of smoked fish and five basically dinner rolls that his mom has packed him. And Andrew says, well, Lord, here's this boy. He's got, he's got some food. He's got a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread, but not much. And Jesus says, have the people sit down and watch what can be done with just a little bit. And you know how the story goes in. They put the fish and the bread in a basket and they start handing it out. And somehow, no matter how many times they reach into the basket, there's always more. <laughs> there's always more. There's always more until everybody has eaten, and there's scraps on the ground. But it was Andrew who brings the boy to Jesus. It's Andrew who introduces the boy to Jesus. Now, another time, another time, and this time it's during Holy Week. It's somewhere between Palm Sunday and Thursday night. We know that during Holy Week, Jesus spent every day preaching and teaching in the temple courts, we also know that during Holy Week, from the time Jesus entered on Palm Sunday up through Thursday night, there was a buzz in Jerusalem. <laughs> there was a buzz about Jesus. Um, people were whispering and talking like, Jesus of Nazareth is here. Jesus of Nazareth is here in Jerusalem for the Passover feast. You know, the one who can heal people, the one who does miracles. I heard he gave sight to a blind man. Really? I heard he can cast out demons. I, I heard he drove demons out. I heard he cured lepers, ten lepers, and cured them of leprosy. I heard a story about they brought a man, on, a man in on a, on a cot who couldn't walk, and, and Jesus told him to walk, and he did. And the, the Pharisees were all upset because it was on the Sabbath, but Jesus told the guy to walk. And they're trading stories, and they're saying, Jesus of Nazareth is here in Jerusalem. It, it, and the, the crowd, it's buzzing through the crowd. Everybody's wondering, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And it says, during that time, 
there were some Gentiles there in Jerusalem. John 12, 20 to 22. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. This is the Passover festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we'd like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Now, who were these Greeks? Well, we don't really know. We know if they were Greeks, they were Gentiles, they weren't Jews. Well, what are these Gentiles, what are these Greeks doing in Jerusalem during the Passover festival? We don't really know. We're not given that background information. We can speculate, why would these Greeks, why would these Gentiles be in Jerusalem during the Passover festival? We know there were Gentiles who were drawn to Judaism. They were often called God-fearers. These Gentiles who were drawn to Judaism, they had dismissed the Greek gods, you know, the pantheon of Greek gods, Zeus and Athena and Aphrodite and all the rest, as just myths, because those gods were capricious and petty and jealous and feuded with each other and tricked mere mortals. Those stories of the Greek gods were not very inspiring. And so there were many Gentiles who said the Jews believe there's just one God, and he's powerful and he's just and he's righteous and he's holy and he's, he's full of grace and mercy. And, and these Greeks were drawn to the, the Jewish concept of God. So maybe they were there because they wanted to learn more about Judaism. Uh, maybe they were just passing through. <laughs> you know, the Greeks, apparently, according to history, the Greeks were some of the first people to actually believe in what we would call tourism, who just traveled for the sake of seeing the sights. Maybe they wanted to go see the magnificent temple. Maybe they were just passing through. For whatever reason, they were there in Jerusalem, and they heard the buzz about Jesus, this miracle worker, this rabbi that everybody was talking about. They wanted to meet him. They wanted to meet this famous guy. You know, you know I'm a geek, a comic book fan. I've been to Comic-Con. When I go, I, want, I wanted to meet Stan Lee, you know, the guy who created the Marvel Universe. I, I got to meet him. I wanted to meet Adam West, the original Batman. I got to meet him. You know, you want to meet these famous people. And so they wanted to meet the famous Jesus. So what did they do? They went up to Philip. And Philip doesn't come across too well in either of these stories. Philip is kind of like, I don't know what to do. You know, Philip is kind of lost. So he goes to Andrew. And Andrew, Andrew brings the Greeks to Jesus. Now, what do these three stories have in common? Andrew brought his brother, Peter, to Jesus. Andrew brought the boy with the sack lunch to Jesus. Andrew brought the Greeks to Jesus. Every story we have of Andrew, he's doing the same thing. He's bringing people to Jesus. Now, as far as we know, you know, Andrew didn't walk on water like his famous brother, Andrew didn't preach the sermon on Pentecost like his famous brother. Andrew didn't do some of the things that we tend to think about as being the high moments of the disciples. Matter of fact, I kind of feel sorry for Andrew because when you read about Jesus, sometimes Jesus would not take everybody. Sometimes he would only take a few for something special. You know, when Jesus goes up to what's called the Mount of Transfiguration, he goes up to this mountaintop, and while he's there, it says his, his clothes became white, and suddenly Moses and Elijah were there with him, and, and Jesus was wearing this brilliant white robe. He brought three disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. Now, who were the four fishing partners? James and John and Peter and Andrew. They were the four guys who worked together, the four fishing partners, and out of those four guys, who did he bring? Peter, James, and John. Who got left out? Andrew. But Andrew doesn't seem to be resentful, doesn't seem to be jealous. Andrew just kept bringing people to Jesus. Andrew just kept inviting people to Jesus. That was his role, inviting people to Jesus. Jesus didn't pick 12 Simon Peters. <laughs> Jesus didn't pick 12 Thomases or 12 Judas Iscariots, thank goodness, or, or 12 Matthews. 
you know, or, or 12. Uh, he didn't pick 12 guys that were just alike. He picked 12 different men with different jobs and different personalities and different talents and different gifts. He didn't pick 12 who all had the same gifts and talents and all had the same personality. No, he picked 12 very different men with different backgrounds and gifts to be the core of his church. And one of those he picked was Andrew. Andrew, whose gift was simply introducing people to Jesus. I read a story years ago that you need to follow me on this story because it starts with a man named Edward Kimball, someone that I would be willing to bet no one here has ever heard of, nor probably would you. A man named Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher in the local church. He taught the boys senior high class. Edward Kimball taught the senior high boys Sunday school class at his local church. And he had a rather rowdy bunch of senior high boys. And he was kind of concerned about some of them. They were a little wild. And this is years back. This is quite a way back. But he had this group of rowdy boys in his senior high boys class. And so this local church, Sunday school teacher of senior high boys, had one, one young man he was particularly a little worried about. So he went to visit the young man at, his, at the young man's part-time job. The, the boy had a part-time job at a shoe store. And... Mr. Mr. Kimball went to the shoe store where the boy worked and waited for him to have a break and waited so he could go back in the back room and just talk to him and talk to him about Jesus. Talk to him about how he felt he really needed um, to receive Christ. Well, the boy did. The boy received Christ. The boy's name was Dwight Moody. And Dwight Moody became a preacher and a world-famous evangelist. But the story doesn't end with Dwight Moody. Dwight Moody became a well-known evangelist. And through his ministry, another young man came to Christ, a man named Wilbur Chapman. And he also became an evangelist. Through his ministry, a baseball player became a Christian and gave up professional baseball to become yet another evangelist. And he was known as Billy Sunday. Well, through Billy Sunday's ministry, yet another preacher was converted. This one named Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham became a traveling preacher. And one day Mordecai Ham went to Charlotte, North Carolina to do a revival, a week of preaching. And there in Charlotte, North Carolina, there was a bunch of high school boys who decided they were going to go to this revival and cause trouble. <laughs> they were going to yell and disrupt and act up and, you know, try to be funny, and they decided they would just go cause some trouble at the revival. And so they went, and there was another boy who was at their high school who didn't want to go cause trouble, but he did want to watch. He just wanted to see what would happen when these other guys were going to cause trouble. So he went... The boys kind of chickened out. They didn't really cause that much trouble. But their friend, Bill, he listened to the preacher. He listened to Mordecai Ham talk about Jesus. So much so that he went back the next night and the next night of the week-long revival. And that boy, that high school boy named Bill, became a Christian. Bill became a Christian, and yes, he became a preacher too. That boy's name was Billy Graham. And if you don't know, Billy Graham, Billy Graham, at least in the 20th century, was the most famous evangelist in the world. To this day, Billy Graham preached to more people in person than anyone in human history. Billy Graham preached the gospel to no, more people than anyone who's ever lived. Um, and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people would trace their salvation back to a sermon by Billy Graham. Now, I say that to, you, to think about the chain, because <laughs> you go backwards through this chain, and you got famous evangelist, famous evangelist, famous evangelist, but then you go back to, guess who starts the chain? A local church Sunday school teacher who taught the senior high boys. The chain starts not with an evangelist, not with a preacher, 
not with anyone who's ever heard, you've ever heard of. The chain begins with a volunteer Sunday school teacher in his local church who agreed to teach senior high boys. And that chain then leads to this person who then converts this person who then converts this person. So the man who starts that chain, Mr. Kimball, Edward Kimball, what did he do? He just introduced people to Jesus. He wasn't a preacher. He wasn't a professional evangelist. He just was a regular Sunday school teacher who taught, taught teenagers about Jesus. You know, and that's kind of how I think about Andrew. You know, Andrew is not as famous as his brother, Simon Peter. Matter of fact, it's kind of irritating because every time Andrew is mentioned in the Bible, they go, Peter's brother, as if, oh, okay, that's his identity. But Andrew's identity wasn't just the fact that he was Peter's brother. He brought Peter to Jesus, but he did even more than that. He just kept being the one that seemed to be the one who kept bringing people and introducing people to Jesus. And that's what most of us are just called to do. Most people aren't called to be evangelists or pastors. Most people are simply called to be used to bring people, to introduce people to Jesus. Whether it's a coworker or somebody you go to school with, somebody in your family. Most of us are simply called to be like Andrew and be willing to usher somebody into the presence of Jesus where they can meet him. The world needs a lot of Andrews and a lot of Andreas. <laughs> the world needs a lot of folks who are willing to just do that. Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful for Andrew. We're thankful for men like Mr. Kimball and thousands, indeed millions of others who have done the very simple thing of introducing someone to Jesus Christ ushering somebody into his presence, providing an opportunity where a friend or a classmate or a coworker or a neighbor could meet Jesus. Lord, help us to all um, not only be grateful for those people, but to be those people. Give us the inspiration and the courage and the opportunity uh, to be those who are willing to be like Andrew um, and to be just conduits of people coming to know Jesus Christ. Amen.